My name is Patricia Alfing. I am faculty in biology here and I want to welcome you to our Spectrum Lecture Series event that we're having today. It's the last one of the semester, so I'm glad you all could make it. Um, it is actually going to be on EMS and paramedics and what they actually do. So we have Kelly Forrest, who is faculty in EMS, and Chris Gage, who is also faculty in EMS, who will be uh, doing the talk today with um, if John Friedenberg needs to pipe in at any time, he will also do so. So I just wanted to welcome you all here, and you guys take it away. Sounds great. Thank you. Uh, our numbers are small, so I challenge you folks to go out and tell five or ten more people about what you hear today. Uh, EMS is a reasonably young profession as far as modern day, uh, less than 50 years old as far as modern day EMS. But before we talk about modern day EMS, I'm going to yield to Chris with that later on. Um, I think it's important to know a little bit about the history of where we came from, uh, why we do some of the things we do today, why we don't do some of the things we don't do today. So we will kind of go from there in regards to the, the history of resuscitation and uh, the history of EMS. And so let me ask a question as we get started. Have any of you ever, ever had to be transported in ambulance before? Okay, okay, so the thing we've lived it. Uh, but we are a young profession. Uh, so we'll go forward from there. So Chris, you'll go ahead. Um, you may think I'm blowing smoke today, and we're going to talk about blowing smoke, but I'm really not. Um, this is, is, some of you may, these are still around for decor, decorative or ornamental purposes, these bellows up here. You know, they're, they're designed originally to uh, fan the fire, to get your fire going. Uh, we'll talk about blowing smoke literally into patients uh, here in a few minutes. But in regards to early resuscitation, blowing smoke was one of the early things that was uh, initiated in regards to... Uh, attempting to, to uh, stimulate a patient back to life. So uh, keep blowing smoke in the back of your mind, but I promise you we're not going to blow smoke. We'll be brief, uh, be accurate, be gone, get you out of here for a little break before we go. I guess it's upstairs here in a little while. Thank you. Uh, so early EMS, so is this a hearse or an ambulance? It's actually both. And, and uh, this, is modern, uh, this is relatively modern day early EMS from about the early 60s on. Um, the first ambulances in most localities were hearses. And the only reason was because you could let a, light, let a patient lie down in the back. Uh, they eventually put radios in them. And some of the old trucks that you look at says they were equipped with oxygen. So this is actually a hearse um, or an ambulance. And I always thought it was kind of interesting. Um, the funeral homes were some of the initial ambulance responders. So, you know, as they would roll up on accident scene, they would look over to the patients and decide which one they wanted. And I always questioned, you know, what, what, what were their motives? But that's, that's as, actually as a joke. Uh, locally, Nason County actually contracted with the local funeral homes back in the late 60s to provide uh, ambulance services. So that, to me, that's kind of creepy, you know, because they just had a funeral at two, and now they're running EMS calls, and you're in the back of that, uh, probably a Cadillac. There are a lot of Cadillacs that were used as a patient. But that's uh, modern-day early EMS. But we'll go back a little further than that, Chris. We'll go to the next one. Uh, in the beginning, the first successful uh, resuscitation documented that I've been able to find, lots of peers, I did write much research to to, to confirm this, uh, actually comes from the Bible, and I won't preach, uh, won't preach to you today, but I do want to share this verse, uh, 2 Kings, verses 434, then he came up and lay, lay on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands, and he has stretched himself, and, he, and as he stretched himself upon him, the flesh of the child became warm. So that's the first uh, successful documented resuscitation that I've been able to find in, in many other peers as well. And as I mentioned the word warm there, uh, long, long ago, uh, a body being warm was associated with life, so we're going to get into some really weird, bizarre things here that, that will, that will um, probably uh, somewhat amaze you as far as things that were attempted to, to bring people back to life as far as early resuscitation. Uh, the bellows, as, as I mentioned earlier, we talked about blowing smoke. Uh, in the 1500s, they would use the bellows, smoke-filled bellows, uh, to try to stimulate someone believed to be dead. Uh, the problem here is it took them a couple hundred years to realize that this airway was going to have to be open, uh, literally a couple hundred years. Uh, and this was obviously successful because this comes from documented, uh, medically accepted or medically approved documented uh, journals that this did work at one time or another. So they would blow uh, tobacco smoke, uh, other types of smoke uh, into, the, into the mouth. Uh, attempting to uh, resuscitate someone and once again it was obviously successful. So as you see all this weird stuff today, keep remembering that uh, physicians and paramedics, we're always practicing medicine. We don't have it right yet. We will never have it or not likely to have it right for a long, long time as far as perfection. Uh, they were practicing medicine and we're still practicing medicine today. Um, so 
uh, talking about blowing smoke, if it, if it worked up here or didn't work up here, uh, someone had the novel idea of blowing it in the other end. So they did rectal fumigation. <coughs> and believe it or not, uh, there was two things this was associated with. And you know, obviously, this, if you can be stimulated, this would stimulate you. Uh, someone sticking something up your backside. Also, uh, putting warm smoke uh, into the backside from the bellows, or here he's actually blowing in orally, uh, was believed more uh, life was associated with warmth. So if you heat up the core of the body uh, with this warm smoke, it may stimulate life. So that was the belief, along with it, uh, obviously the internal stimuli as you see there. So that's about as uh, weird as we'll have to go today. But it is important because uh, we're still doing some things. Uh, right now we tap, we tap and shout. So uh, we'll go to the next one, Chris. Um, 1700s once again, drowning victims. Early on, they realized. If they would invert the patient, let the water drain out, and also compress the chest uh, to help get the water out, this was a, a treatment for um, drowning patients, and this came to be through the Royal Humane Society, and not like the Humane Society related to dogs or things that we see it as today, but in regards to people uh, for drowning victims back in uh, the 1700s. And obviously, this is in medical journals. This was a, an accepted technique that was successful. Um, but we don't string we don't string drowning victims up today. But that's what they did back then in regards to trying to stimulate life. Uh, many of you probably heard the term uh, "You've got me over the barrel," or "I've got you over the barrel," whatever. This was actually a technique that was used uh, rolling someone over a barrel uh, with a rhythm uh, to a rhythm, and that was that mimics the breathing process. That was a, a medically accepted technique as well. Uh, draping someone over a horse that was thought to be dead, attempting to resuscitate them. That, that canter that horses can do, or a, a gait that horses have, that was known to bring back life. Uh, and then we get into some very, very early forms of uh, 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 CPR. They're actually not compressing the chest, but attempting to move air in and out of the lungs, the two pictures at the bottom there. So uh, pretty strange stuff. Um, Tongue stretching, we have the, the, those dark French, we have to thank them for this. Uh, there was a technique uh, developed by the French in the uh, late 1800s to rhythmically stretch the tongue and not, not like stick your tongue out as far as you can. Now, Chris, this is where the, uh, the demonstrator posts, so <laughs> come on up. No, I'm just kidding. I'm picking on I like to pick on it. But they had a technique. They were would, they would rhythmic, rhythmically uh, in a rhythm. Uh, actually stretched the tongue repeatedly and that was known to stimulate some people to start breathing again and believe it or not uh, do and documented factually this is where the French kiss came from uh, and my volunteers wasn't for the French kiss it was actually just to pull Chris's tongue down to about his belt. Um, having served in the Army and he's a former Marine so I put the Army up here because I made the presentation. Um, the Army comes rolling along that little line from the Army fight song there. Uh, military, military contributions to medicine are great and long. Uh, Napoleon on the battlefield, he was one of the first generals or one of the first military commanders to recognize that if you uh, were able to get wounded soldiers from the field to a field hospital or to a higher level of care, their chances of survival were much greater. So I just want to throw that in in regards to the early, early military contributions to medical care, pre-hospital medical care. Uh, traction saves lives. This is a little hard to see with the lighting here, but that's okay. This is a traction splint, a very early traction splint. Uh, we still carry traction splints on the truck today. If your femur is broken uh, because of the, the break in the bone, uh, there's a great great increase uh, to trauma to the muscles. There's much, uh, much more increased bleeding. And we apply that traction splint and uh, uh, take the spasm away from those muscles and, and realign, realign that bone a little bit. Thousands and thousands of soldiers' lives were saved thanks to the, the, uh, the use of the traction splint during, uh, actually early on World War I. Uh, is when it, when it first became prominent and, and, and in use in regards to pre-hospital care. And like I say, we still carry them on the trucks today. We don't put them on that often, but when, when needed and necessary, they're a very useful tool. So they, they <coughs> save a lot of lives and result uh, in regards to uh, decreasing lo uh, loss of life via blood loss uh, through fractures. Uh, from the Korean era here, uh, the first medevac helicopters were used. Once again, to get the soldiers from the field to a field hospital or a mass unit. Uh, the interesting thing here is this is where your patient is. So once you put your patient in there and close him up, there was no treatment en route, as you'll see in, in a picture. Uh, Chris flew air care for a number of years. He's doing patient care from the time he contacts the patient on care all the way to the hospital. But this was uh, one of the early medevac pictures. And soldiers did survive. Uh, this wasn't the best of rides. It looks more like a coffin to me. But it obviously got them from point, point A to point B. Uh, and increase their chances of survival. 
uh, from, from wounds encountered on the, on the battlefield. Um, there was another military point I wanted to make. I can't remember what it was. Um, how many of you have had an EKG before? Okay, well this is your first EKG machine. Uh, now we carry them around in a box about uh, this, this long, by this high, by this wide. Uh, but this is your first EKG machine. You see there's a lot of hardware. Uh, they have his uh, feet and hands soaking in uh, salt water to help conduct electricity. But this was a, uh, an early uh, EKG machine, uh, actually one of the first, if not the first. And electricity is good. If the heart stops, we can do lots of things with electricity in the back of the truck, but I don't want to steal his fire. He'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so that big machine that you just witnessed, this was actually the first, um, this is the more of a late 60s, early 70s EKG machine. This half of this box, uh, this is a Life Pack 5. John, you probably trained on those, or maybe did you use them? I don't want to insult you. Yeah, we had the generation before. Okay, uh, so we've, we've been doing this a long time. Uh, this was your diagnostic part of the machine to, to, to get your EKG. And this is if you needed electrical therapy, this is how we, 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 use, we actually use pads now. These are paddles that you would grease up and you have to apply 25 pounds of force to deliver that electricity and hit the buttons. Uh, so we came from that previous slide, that great big machine, to uh, even in the late 60s, a box this small that we could, we could uh, run an EKG on you in the field. The thing about it was though until uh, probably the early 90s, we actually had to transmit this EKG via what's called an uh, APCOR radio to the hospital. Now they, they trust and expect us to be able to uh, analyze and uh, determine what's going on with that EKG in the back of the truck rather than uh, send it to the hospital for, for, a, for a doctor to uh, determine what's going on with the patient as far as if it's a heart attack or whatever. So we'll go to the next one. So this is a machine that we would hook that EKG machine up to uh, late 60s, early 70s, actually not uh, I need to go forward a little bit. Late 70s, early 80s, in regards to sending that EKG to, to the hospital, we hooked that machine up to this, this radio, and via telemetry, the doctor could, and then any of you remember the old show Emergency, uh, Johnny and Roy, uh, the paramedics on that show, they would send that to, what's the doctor's name? I think of his name. Uh, Rampart. Say again? Rampart. Rampart Hospital. Uh, I know Dix was a nurse, and I remember the, the doctor's name. But anyway, uh, if you haven't had, if you've seen that show, they would have to send that in by radio. And now we run a 12 lead, and we actually make a decision whether to call to activate the uh, cath lab. And once again, I'm still in his fire. We may bypass the ED to go straight to the cath lab based on what we see. And that's that we're blessed to do that via the physicians as long as you know what you're looking at. Go ahead. Um, first, first true modern day CPR, late 50s. Uh, Doc, uh, James Eelman, Dr. Safer, primarily Dr. Safer. He put the, uh, the, the air going in and out, had to happen. The chest compressions had to happen together. And the first CPR, actually, uh, uh, modern world CPR came to be in 1957. I'd like to tip the hat to these guys because it's still what we're doing today. 30 and 2 hard and fast on an adult, uh, 30 and 2 on an infant child, unless you have two rescuers, and then you drop back to uh, 15 and 2. Um, John recently promoted a program here to get all of our staff trained, faculty and staff trained in the use of an AD. Uh, if someone goes into uh, a deadly chaotic rhythm, if their heart goes into that rhythm, every minute that passes, if they're not shocked, their chances of survival, you see the table here, goes down 10%. So that's why I'm thankful we're going to have these in every building. I hope we never need them. I hope they gather dust and uh, will eventually age out um, uh, as far as the, the uh, needing to be replaced, but uh, we need these in police cars, we need them on the wall, we need them everywhere because we've got a lot of good data. The sooner that you get those pads on someone and shock them if they need to be shocked, is going to greatly increase their chances of survival. Uh, and this is one of, uh, compared to the old uh, Korean era uh, medevac helicopter. Uh, Chris, you said you didn't fly on this one, right? Um, was this before or after? Or? This is, uh, they had it, but it was at a different station. Okay, uh, so he did air care for a, for a good number of years and talking about working tight quarters, he'll tell you all about that later. But this is a little more modern day. Um, so we have paramedics, then we have critical care paramedics. You see this is one of Brenner's trucks. You, you never worked off this one, I don't guess. Um, but, um, and if you're a critical care medic, that's, one, that's a little more knowledge and a little, uh, substantially more expectation on your knowledge, skills, and experience if you're a critical care medic. Uh, modern day, uh, monitor defibrillator, that's, uh, that's what we have over in public safety, that's what we're training our students on. We can look at your heart and we can also shock it. 
Uh, those are starting out about $25,000 with lots of bells and whistles, up to forty-five. And uh, one of my students actually rolled one off the stretcher down the hill, not one of the colleges, but uh, working part-time. But we've got insurance on them, so they can be repaired with a lot of, lot of, uh, lot of uh, ability there with that cardiac monitor. Uh, locally, how many of you live in Davidson County? Okay, so just a little about our local, our local EMS service. Uh, actually originated in 1967. We did contract with the funeral homes initially. Uh, a lot of those guys work at the funeral home went on went to get their advanced first aid. That's what the treatment was at the time, advanced first aid. Uh, paramedics weren't heard of at the time. But Davis County was the first county-based EMS service in North Carolina. We did contract with, uh, contract with the funeral homes. The initial level of training was advanced first aid and as years progressed, late, uh, late 70s, uh, mid late 70s, excuse me, late 60s, advanced first aid, um, uh, early mid 70s, EMT basic, uh, late 70s, and this is the order that the county progressed as far as our levels of certification, EMT intermediate, and then finally the first paramedics in uh, North Carolina was in 1981, another new Mary remembers Brian Cyphers, he apparently carries around his little box of sodium bicarb, which was the first line drug for VFIP back then, he tells his story and I love to hear it. Uh, it was the first ALS drug administered in Davidson County on a Sunday morning back in 1981, and he was the guy that pushed the syringe uh, here locally. Uh, at present, we have 10 advanced life support units uh, here in the county. Uh, two quick response vehicles in the county that can get treatment started. Uh, lots of rescue squads, but you think in uh, 10 ambulances, that's a lot. We run out of ambulances all the time. We've got two in Lexington, two in Davidson County. Uh, they, our service can be overwhelmed quite readily, and we rely on our neighboring um, counties to north, south, east, and west as needed. Um, but but that, that's a, we've got a good service. We've got a lot of ground to cover. Um, 162,000 people, 582 square miles. I know I went from Arcadia to Denton to run a call, and from Denton to Arcadia to run a call. Uh, that's a long haul. It's uh, 55, 57 miles from the northernmost point to the southernmost point. And I've actually done that on a bad, what I call a bad day, where there are no other trucks available. Uh, so it happens. Modern day, you probably see these on the road all the time, and um, that's a typical ALS unit we have here locally. We're good, Chris. Uh, last Friday, if you were around, you might have seen some scary Moolah's patients walking around. Uh, was our mass casualty incident drill for our, our graduating students. I have eight that are finishing the program. Uh, they will take their final soon. Uh, they will test at the state soon. And they, they most of all, uh, seven out of eight are already working for a service, a number of them full time, so their life gets very complicated this time of year. I think I've got just a couple pictures of that. Uh, we've got these two ambulances. They're old, but they work great. We're very thankful to have them. Uh, and we can make it run run uh, mock calls in these going up and down the road and give it a fairly realistic, uh, give them a fairly realistic challenge in the backs of these old ambulances, but they work good and they're serving well and we're very thankful. So last Friday, this is what the students rolled up on. Uh, John and Sam Olszynski uh, put together a scenario and the scenario was, uh, we renamed the burn tower down here, the, the uh, DCCC apartments. Uh, an evicted tenant came back angry and started shooting everyone. When he ran out of rounds, he went to work with a machete. When uh, he got tired of slinging the machete, he went to work with a knife. Uh, they had no clue what they were responding to, but on the way, what they drove up on, they knew they were going to the apartments once we dispatched them for this call. Uh, they also happened upon a truck from another county that had collided with a police car, and uh, so that was their scenario. Uh, they had about 18 patients uh, to triage, uh, and further assess, treat, and transport. So this is what they walked up on, and uh, as they got, as they, as they exited their ambulances, and there was a real good article in Thomasville Times. You have, have a chance to see those in Wednesday's paper. So uh, they were very, very challenged. Uh, I'll be honest with you; they didn't know whether to run or stay or quit. Uh, but they, all in all, they, they, it was a very good learning experience. They did a lot of things wrong, but that's why we drill to make things we do wrong right. So that's okay. Uh, so just a couple pictures there. Our, our cosmetology department. They're, to me, they're scary as far as what they can do with mock, pa mock patients. Pam Gregory and the folks over there, uh, salute to them because they're really, really good. And what's interesting, most of our mock victims are former students that want to come back and just kind of give these guys the, the business as far as making it difficult for them. Um, so just a few more pictures. And let's see. A little bit of a challenge there. Lots of patients to bring downstairs that were severely injured. I don't know how long this goes on. If it's too long, we don't have to watch it all. See how I'm running on time. We can go ahead to the next one. But they're very challenged. They had light patients, heavy patients. 
Um, I joke about this. Uh, we have done a very good job in educating the public that we can do more than drive the ambulance. So people still call us ambulance drivers. We're not offended, but we want to work harder to let them realize what we can do. And uh, Chris is going to expand on that. So you go ahead, sir. All right, so I'm uh, Chris Gage. Um, again, so um, he talked about the things that he did uh, when he started, I mean, back in history. Thank you. Um, and uh, so we're just going to talk about some things that we do now. Um, you know, this is just a picture of one of our, um, one of our classes right here. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about the education that it takes to become some of the different levels that you have to be. So um, the, Kelly's already talked about some of the, um, the names of what they're called, the certifications. So initial training over here, about 190 hours uh, for an initial class and the classroom time for an EMT. Um, and there's 24 hours of clinical time. So this is going to be time where they have to actually go out in uh, like a hospital environment or um, right now they're doing like EMS. They'll actually go out to the different uh, services and they will do that many hours um, at that service. They have to get, I think, 10 patient contact. Um, um, so, you know, they're actually out there in the service doing the doing this. How recent are those clinical hours for the EMT? They're brand new. I was going to say. Yeah. Um, and then you have the advanced EMT, so uh, National Registry, which is a board, which is a group that um, kind of but they're almost a little leading the way right now with a, a name change going from an intermediate to an advanced EMT. Um, so the advanced EMT right now is 256 hours of the classroom time and then 48 hours of clinical. So they have to spend a little more time out there. And then you've got the paramedic down here, which is 660 hours of class time and they have 340 uh, hours worth of clinicals. So to become a paramedic, you actually have to um, do the EMT first you can skip the advanced paramedic and you would go straight, or you skip the advanced EMT and go straight to paramedic. So a lot of people don't get the advanced EMT, they just kind of go from EMT just straight to paramedic. So if you added all those hours between EMT and paramedic, that would be the minimum amount of time that it takes to actually become a paramedic, to be working in the street or wherever you're at. Once you get through with the classroom work, then like Kelly's students, um, they're going to be going to take their state uh, or national uh, paramedic certification exam. And if they pass it, then they'll be able to go work somewhere. Uh, these are some refresher training. So just because you get your uh, uh, initial certification, you're going to have to keep up with, uh, you know, doing training on top of that. So 20 hours a year, uh, 25 hours a year, and 30 hours a year respectively for the different uh, certifications. If you don't get those training hours per year, you won't get your certification back once it runs out. Um, depends on the uh, state of North Carolina does it for four years and then uh, National Registry, if that's a, it's a paramedic certification. Some feel it's a little more prestigious though. Um, you would get that every two years, but um, these, are the, these are the state of North Carolina numbers right here. And one thing to, a lot, the reason a lot of folks do not take advanced EMT, what used to be known as EMTI, services will usually only pay you for EMT basic, or paramedic. There's no intermediate pay. Um, so that's one reason a lot of folks choose to bypass this or avoid, uh, just not go there. Um, so, so uh, you know, we hear a lot of people say, um, oh, you're an ambulance driver, that's cool. Like, no, we're not. Um, so there's a lot of things that we can do out there. So this over here is, a, um, is just one example of what a protocol is. So a protocol is pretty much, um, it's a set of things that you can go ahead and do, either skill procedures, medications, uh, what you need to do if you need to shock a patient with your monitor, if you need to do something else. So a protocol is uh, set forth by not only the State of North Carolina Medical Board, but it's also set by your medical director. And these are things that you can go ahead and do before you have to call anybody. So um, you can see down here at the bottom, I know some people can't see, it says notify destination or contact medical control. But look at all these other things right here that can be done before you have to call anybody. So this is just one of the protocols. We actually have 102 protocols listed in the state of North Carolina that, um, that a paramedic can do before he, has to, or he or she has to call anybody. So some things aren't really um, that in depth like pain management. You know, you might be able to give a pain medicine or don't give a pain medicine, you know, take them to the hospital. But there's 102 protocols that um, we as instructors and us as providers work in EMS, we're pretty much, you know, you should know most of these protocols inside and out, know exactly what you need to do. Um, but they are there for you if you need to um, 
to, um, to use them. And I got a couple examples up here. Uh, seizure, uh, if a patient has a seizure, you know, there's one for that. OB emergencies, um, cardiac arrest, uh, there's a couple different ones for different rhythms and stuff. Um, you know, um, there's pediatric, there's a whole slew of pediatric ones, adult ones, um, you know, it's pretty much the whole gamut of anything you run into. If you run a patient with a poisoning, um, you know, there's multiple different poisonings inside of that protocol and then different lists for each one of those uh, poisoning uh, idea or, um, uh, you know, toxidromes, as they say. So there's uh, 60 skill or procedures that a uh, paramedic can do in the state of North Carolina. Some of the ones it talks about is uh, endotracheal intubation. So uh, if you stop breathing, we can take a tube and place it on your throat. I'm sure most people have seen uh, um, movies or TV shows, people on ventilator, they see the plastic tube hanging out of their mouth. We can do uh, IVs, which is pretty standard. We can also do IOs. So if you look at this down here, this is an intraosseous um, device. So what it actually does is it screws a, um, a needle, a hard needle, inside your bone. And you can actually push uh, fluids and medications. You can pretty much give everything through uh, intraosseous uh, device as you can in, um, an IV. Um, and then we can do RSI. So RSI is called rapid sequence intubation. So for some reason, if you're having a severe, let's say you've had a head injury and you're unconscious and you won't come back around and we're fear of you, you know, throwing up or bombing or something, we can give you uh, medications to be able to uh, place that plastic tube that I was talking about down your throat. Uh, we can do things if you're a choking patient in a, in a restaurant and we can't get your, uh, you know, your uh, food particle out of your mouth, we can cut a hole in your throat, place that tube down. We can, uh, you know, tourniquets and stuff like that, which uh, are available for multiple levels, but uh, we can do a lot of things. Um, and then there's 90 medication drug classes for the state of North Carolina. If you go to uh, North Carolina EMS website right now, you can pull, pull these up. So like um, a medication class would be like a beta blocker. Okay, well a beta blocker, if you give to somebody, is actually going to slow the heart rate down a little bit, lowers the blood pressure, but there's multiple different types of beta blockers. So just because we have 90 classes does not mean that's you know, all that we could give. Um, so we can give everything, like it says, beta blockers right there, uh, narcotic antagonists, so that would be like um, Narcan that you hear about all the time, people overdose on opioids, you know, aspirin, lidocaine, there's a bunch of uh, anti-dysrhythmics for your heart and stuff, uh, so we can give a lot of those. And then fibrolytics, those are things that are going to be like uh, called clot busters. So let's say that you know somebody has a heart attack, they go to the hospital, they know they're having a heart attack, uh, they can give them a clot buster and they could you know get the clot to bust up. So there are some services around here. Um, some services are doing uh, like Iredell County, they're actually placing chest tubes in people. So if you get a collapsed lung, they can actually place a chest tube in you. Um, they also have a device, uh, everybody's heard of an ultrasound. They actually have ultrasound devices that uh, you can uh, do an ultrasound to see if somebody has a heartbeat, uh, even though you don't feel a pulse. Um, they can scan for babies, you know, if the baby's moving around inside the mom, uh, they can do IVs with the ultrasound. So they can look for collapsed lungs if you have a hole in your chest to see if you have um, what potentially would be a problem for you if your lung collapsed. Um, for Scythe County, we give antibiotics um, on the truck. We give, um, if, uh, if somebody was to have a real bad internal wound that was bleeding really bad, instead of just rushing them to the hospital, we can actually give a medicine that goes in and clots up that blood inside of your, um, inside of your body so you don't bleed out inside, internally. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff that we can do right now. Um, sometimes we have, um, um, we'll go out and do a cardiac arrest, uh, you know, at somebody's house and we'll stay inside now for 30 minutes now. We don't transport to the hospital anymore unless we get something back. And we'll stay inside for 30 minutes. We'll do everything that uh, is going to be done in the hospital. There's absolutely nothing life-saving that they're going to be able to do at the hospital that we can't do. Um, and we have a lot of people, you know, ask, you know, like, why are you staying on scene? We can do every single thing that they can do at the hospital. So there's no reason to transport. It's really unsafe holding on to that rail in the back of the ambulance and shaking around and you know, again, we can pretty much do everything. Um, so these are some of the places that, um, well, first of all, this is the helicopter that I rode on. This is the one down in Lexington. Um, I worked over there for about six years. 
Um, loved it, worked on the ground unit, um, but I usually worked on the helicopter here for the most part. These are some different places that uh, paramedics can work now. We used to only be able to, you know, like Kelly talked about, you know, paramedics really weren't doing anything back until about the 70s or so, um, as far as like actually working um, for a service or something like that. When did you say it was in the uh, first one in paramedic in Davis County? 81? Yes, so up until 81, paramedics weren't really doing anything. Now we can work uh, 91 ambulance services, so like your county ambulance, you call uh, 91, you know, somebody shows up. You've got your non-emergency ambulance. Uh, if you go down to Rowan County, there's a new care service down there. They actually hire paramedics to do like inter-facility transports. They'll transport from the VA down here in Rowan County to the VA in, you know, Duke or uh, the one up here that they have in uh, Kernersville now, so there's services there. Uh, a lot of fire departments are going to uh, um, Pretty much every fire department now has an EMT basic. Okay, all the firemen are EMT basics. Um, some of them have advanced, the advanced EMT or the intermediate they talk about, and some even have paramedics that arrive on the fire truck themselves. So that uh, should be a pretty cool job. Um, critical care, ground and air. Um, we already talked about that. Uh, there's helicopters and there's planes. Um, I know CMC or Charlotte uh, Medical Center. They actually have a plane that travels. Um, um, I know a girl that used to work there from. You know, they'll go down to the Bahamas and pick somebody up. You know, Mary, we love her to death. If she's down there, then we're going to go down there and pick her up because we care about her. And, you know, and you know, somebody's willing to pay for them to bring them back. So we don't want her to be taken care of the Bahamas. We want her good care. Um, a lot of emergency rooms now are starting to hire paramedics. So um, what once was a nursing field, uh, we've started kind of moving in there. Uh, you know, we... Uh, they realize that we can do all the same skills that a nurse can, and most of the time paramedics are paid less, and so they see that as an advantage for the, you know, for, um, you know, they're getting the same work for, you know, being paid less. Um, but so emergency rooms, so community paramedicine, everybody's heard of a home health nurse. So paramedics are starting to go out and start doing home health care. Um, we'll go out, um, a lot, it's really new right now, so a lot of the stuff that we're doing is we're, we're going out, um, let's say that, uh, you know, John Doe over here has called 911 10 times in the past week, you know, or 10 times in the past two weeks. We probably need to go out and see if we can hail John Doe with something, because something's wrong. You just don't call 911 the last 10 weeks, or last two weeks or whatever. Um, so we might go out and look at his medicine, look at his uh, home, you know, is he living in good conditions, does he, does he have access to being able to get to medical care, does he have a doctor, does he feel like the only doctor is in the emergency room, because that's really not a good doctor to have if you're wanting continuous care, you know, maybe you need to go down to a clinic, maybe you need to get uh, some more supervised care, maybe you don't need to live at home anymore, maybe you need to go to a rehab facility or nursing home or something, or assisted living center. So those are kind of some of the things that, uh, that uh, community paramedicine are going out now. Um, Forsyth got about uh, six, either six or eight um, full-time paramedics that are community paramedicine work. So they're actually going out and doing all that. They've got vehicles, they've got their own assignment, you know, they, if a new patient calls in, they get assigned to them and they're going out and they're, uh, you know, doing all, all kinds of hours. Um, in doctor's offices, some are going in, again, filling in those uh, spots that used to be nurses' slots. They're going in doing stuff like that. Uh, there's a lot of services now that um, are asking for paramedics to go overseas. I get emails all the time, you know, we'll pay $150,000 to go to, um, you know, Dubai and go over there and work for their 911 system. No, I'm not going over there. Maybe, but no. Um, that's a lot of money. Uh, oil fields, oil rigs. Uh, I've got friends that go and uh, you know they'll go to an oil field or oil rig. I had a um, um, guy that I used to work with. He went over and he flew on a helicopter and did um, like um, kind of like if you were if you were hurt in the middle of nowhere and they said we really need this person out of here, then he would get on the helicopter and he'd be the paramedic fly out to you know, some uh, deserted place in the middle of Iraq or, you know, Iran or something like that. He had his gun and everything, and I was hey, have at it. I'm not doing that. Um, ships, uh, and again, like 9 services. Uh, and then um, I get stuff every once in a while, like cruise ships. Cruise ships have paramedics on board, you know. If somebody gets hurt in the, in the dining hall or whatever, then, you know, somebody responds out there to go pick them up, move them back to the... To the medical area underneath the ship so uh, I've looked at some of those you have to do it for like nine months at a time and you can't go home and you know, it just don't seem it just don't seem too much for them. Those community um, paramedics 
Where are they affiliated with? A hospital or a private agency or what? It depends. Both are at Um <coughs> It's so new that most places are just doing it straight out of the uh, county EMS. Um, right now, they do not have... Right now, the biggest push they're trying to do is trying to get funding for it because insurance companies aren't really on board yet and saying like, oh, you're the exact same as a home health nurse. We're going to pay you by insurance. So a lot of it is um, the county is suffering the cost for the, the service, but you know within the next you know year or two things will change as far as like getting funded back. But you got a good point. If a hospital, it's really good for the hospital because the hospital has a problem where if you get discharged and you get readmitted within 30 days, that hospital eats every bit of that cost. So it's really good for the hospital that they have somebody out in the field that says, hey, you go out there and take care of them, you know, try as hard as you can not to get them to be readmitted. Because if when they get readmitted, we're going to have to eat every bit of that cost from the time they get readmitted to the time they get back out because Medicare and Medicaid is not paying for them. So, um, you know, there's a little bit of both in that. But right now, it's usually just the county EMSs are picking up that bill. Chris, with um, one of the major hospital systems up in New York, started a community environmental program. And after the first year, when we looked at the cost savings, um, they had about a 511% return on investment for the program, just in saved transport and saved fuel visits and saved readmissions. Makes a lot of sense. Because we have, we have a lot of problems with, um, you know, that, that one that I said you'll go out and pick up 10 times in two weeks. I mean, that's a lot of resources, you know. You know, me and Kelly are going out on, a, on an ALS unit. You know, what if, you know, John Doe down the street goes into cardiac arrest? Well, now that Tyro unit has to go all the way to Denton or, you know, I mean, so, you know, for 10 units in the county, if somebody's, you know, they're not really abusing it, but if they, you know, calling a lot for almost no reason, then, you know, somebody needs to go out there and check on it to save some resources. So I put this picture, this is my son, so whether you're a, a new, maybe, wannabe paramedic, next. That's the end. Next. <laughs> That's the end. Or you're a seasoned paramedic. This has got toilet detail next week, John. Next. <laughs> I was afraid to get the clicker. Is he trying to make an old joke? We're, we're here, we want to be here for everybody, so, you know, we're here, um, uh, most most EMS services, most paramedics, EMTs, whatever. Um, you know, most people in sub public safety, they are they they're just really good people. They're really out to help you as much as they can. They're uh, that's just I mean my life call is to help people. I mean even coming here to the college, you know, just just teaching people how to do my job. I mean I just love being able to give back and do and help and um, you know so we're. We're good people. Kelly's good people, whether I make fun of them or good, not. Good cornhole champions. Yeah, good <laughs> cornhole champions, by the way. Hey, I did I did want to point out that uh, um, not all of us wanted to show our trophies off. Kelly's got his turned around the wrong way. <laughs> he didn't know I was going to play that game. Uh, so what kind of questions y'all have? So you ahead. talk about a lot of new stuff. So there's been a lot of changes, I would say, like in the last five years or oh, so, yeah. maybe. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, yeah. I grew up in this community in the fire department and and stuff and I was really surprised at a lot of the stuff you listed that y'all could do like that you couldn't do yeah. before. Oh okay. yeah. Just to give you an idea, January the state um, mandated more training. Yeah, um, those hours and like so mm -hmm. now they're required to take the more in depth anatomy. Yes, I have as to take well, as yes. before, you know, it wasn't such a big mm -hmm. they took yeah. a smaller class. So there's so much new stuff that there's actually a, called a transition program mm -hmm. that we've learned that from, you know, like these guys coming about, even from when I came about, even in two thousand fourteen, if you got any education after two thousand fourteen, <laughs> you have to actually take a transition course to pick up on all the new stuff that you weren't even taught about. Mm -hmm. And you have to pick it up by the time that you renew your certification because if you don't pick the class up, then you actually cannot recertify. That's how much new stuff is a new course well, has been developed. they've done the same thing with the fire service too as well, haven't they? Like, because I know yes. a lot, so all the firemen have had to take new classes and... Yeah, it all goes hand in hand. Right. Um, what a lot of people have to understand, down here in North Carolina, an entry-level paramedic is much different than say New York City because you have to be down here because you have to be able to take care of somebody for the 40 minutes it takes you to get mm -hmm. to the hospital mm -hmm. which these guys all know when I came down here that's completely I have to learn to be a paramedic all over in the back of an ambulance 
So the things they do down here are a lot more aggressive, but they have to be. So the program here is, there is no waste of time. Um, the people we put out, the people that just graduated to the state exam and Kelly's class of graduates this week, right, and these guys are good to go anywhere in the country. Um, they meet the standards, but unlike firefighters and cops and nurses, if we don't maintain our certification and maintain the changes and reflect that we can adapt to the changes, we lose your certification. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, is, it, is a hard, it is a hard class. I mean, when Kelly and I came on the job in the early 80s, an EMT class was 40 hours. Now it's 200, mm -hmm. 224 hours. Oh, yeah. I took the class 15 years ago, but I took it, and there was no class. Hours, that's why I yeah, it's just the hours just started. Yeah, now everything's computer based, so you have to prove your skills. You have to have peer reviewed skills. You have to have instructor reviewed skills. Um, it's it's a good job, and it has a lot of responsibility to it. And, uh, so, what about career ladder mobility? So, if you're going to be a firefighter, you have to be able to go a nursing program or to uh, pre-med or? So I'll tell you that I'm going to Western Carolina right now to get my bachelor's degree actually finished up this summer. Um, my two-year degree transferred into their two year, first two years of the four-year degree, so I just had to finish out the two years. And then if I wanted to, I could have went the science track, and if I took the science track, then I could have been pre-qualified for uh, PA school, med school, whatever, you know, whatever after that. Um, right now, you, uh, what, um, sorry, uh, Winston-Salem State, they have a paramedic to a BSN program. Mm -hmm. So if you have the uh, two-year degree paramedic, you actually have your paramedic state certified, then you can transfer all those courses in for the first two years of their program, and so you go two more years for the bachelor's degree. Um, there's there are some places, I want to say uh, A&T might have that option as well, uh, to bring a two-year degree medical field, I think, into and get the bachelor's degree for nursing. We have a lot of people, there's a group down in uh, Atlanta, Georgia called Excelsior Program yeah. that a lot of people do the, um, you know, they have their two-year degree paramedic and they go down and get there. But that would just be getting a two, uh, a, just the nursing you know, license itself, it wouldn't be for a four-year degree. So you degree. see more pathway towards the nursing than you do? Um, yes and no. There's a lot of people, usually the people that are, um, you know, I want to go be a PA. Okay, well they need a thousand hours of patient contact hours. So they'll usually get their EMT mm -hmm. and then they'll go work for a service. And then, you know, I've worked at Forsyth uh, since 2003. We have a lot of people that are EMTs up there that are trying to get into PA school. So we have a lot of people doing that. We still have a lot of people going through the, the paramedic. They usually work a couple more years before they finally, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do something different. So that's when they go, you know, nursing, PA school, um, or something like that. So are you finding that the graduates are getting are being paid by hour or salary? Uh, definitely hour. Definitely hour. And it's, it's tough for us to compete with nursing. We lose yeah. a lot of people to <coughs> springboard from EMS to nursing because of the pay. And I can give you an example. My son started out at Cone, thirty-one dollars an hour as a brand new nurse, working Saturdays and Sundays in one week, one one night a week, every other week, and they considered that full time. I never made thirty-one dollars an hour as a paramedic. And the most I know right now that a new person coming in as a paramedic um, is a little less than seventeen dollars an hour. I've been working at Forsyth uh, for uh, fourteen years and don't even make twenty dollars an hour. So the pay, but again, it's. It's one reason it's because they're so new, you know, so a new, new, yeah. new group, you know, I mean, yeah, we're not that new, but I mean, you're 20 or 30 years old, nursing is, you know, you know, long time. People know about nursing, you know, we don't have a, we don't really need a lecture series to come in and talk about nursing, because everybody knows about nursing, everybody knows, you know, nurses can do a lot of stuff, but when you hear, you know, somebody talk about paramedic, you know, we joke around about an ambulance driver, a lot of people think, you know, like, oh, you're an ambulance driver, that's cute, you know, congratulations. You know, they just don't know what all the things that we can do. Another thing's going to be, um, sorry, me cut you off. Another thing uh, is uh, that most of the places we can work at are a county-based tax service, and you know, you don't want your taxes to go up to pay my salary even more. I mean, we can barely do anything with education and stuff like that. Until so you need something, so you need it. Exactly, until you need it, then sure, pay whatever they need to. But you know, that's just. But not. it's also insurance reimbursement too, isn't it? I mean. 
I'm sure it is some. I'm sure I know. I know in Forsyth County, um, everything that gets reimbursed goes into a pot in the county, and then the county distributes it out to who they want to. Mm -hmm. I know that we uh, we had a new lady that came into the billing um, billing department, and she started getting back uh, Social Security checks. Um, if you if you won on the lottery, I mean, she was tagging that stuff. I mean, she was getting every possible thing. I think we made about an extra million dollars in one year from new revenue from her being able to get new stuff, and we still didn't get any more money from the tag. It just went into that pot, and then you know. And to compliment what Chris was saying about people not knowing what we can do and not do, recently, Mary, we had a group of orthopedic doctors come to our service and say, bring them here, bring them here, bring them to this ED, we can fix it. And uh, we started telling them what we cared as far as pain relief. They were dumbfounded that we had fentanyl, morphine, and everything else. They are like, y'all have all that? And that was doctors wanting us to bring patients to their facilities. But then, two weeks later, we had a patient with a just a simple broken bone, you know, no multiple system trauma. We called that hospital, we'll take them there, and the, and the doctor in the ED said, no, don't bring them here, we can't handle that. So there's communications issues with us yeah. and them, and them and them, you know, the doctors talking themselves. So we've got, we're getting there, but we've got a long ways to go. I went to a clinic in, um, in Clemens the other day and picked up a lady who was having really, really bad shortness of breath, and I started asking the, um, the person, I didn't know exactly who it was, you know, well, did you get this? Did you get that? Did you get this? And he, he just kind of looked at me and I was like, are you, are you the nurse? And he's like, no, I'm the PA. And I was like, oh my gosh. Like, you know, I was telling him things that he hadn't even thought about. And we carried most of the stuff on the ambulance and he hadn't even thought about giving any of it. It's a, it's a world just, of difference. I got to go upstairs, but that ambulance that was the, um, also the ambulance that was the Hearst? Yes. I drove, I was the nurse that was in the back of that ambulance when I first started off in a rural area. And I can remember once going from, I mean, we were really rural in the, in the Catskill Mountains, and we had to go from the Catskill Mountains to Albany. And I was never so sick <laughs> and going with that patient on those back roads. My friend probably still has that. Yeah. <laughs> we we probably shall break and we'll get you out here. Well, thank more. you. I'm oh, sorry. Thank you guys very much. Very thank you. Thanks, Mary. Is, is part of the confusion that in some states you do have just ambulance drivers versus EMTs as well? Because I know in no, West Virginia that happens. With, with the new national standards, everybody has to be national standards. I mean, you do have some people I can fly to problems that do just drive, um, but there is no more. Has that changed driving. recently? Yeah. Okay. We usually handle that when the cop tells us, you know, ask the ambulance driver, we tell the person to go ask the cop car driver. Right. Um, well, I know in West Virginia they had it as a separate position, yeah. like you could drive an ambulance without yeah. being an EMT. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They used to say ambulance attendant here in North yeah, Carolina. Ambulance attendant, yeah. So if you could pass your skills but couldn't pass a written test, you could be an ambulance attendant. Okay. Well, that was long ago. Yeah. Um, but so is that not part of the issue that may be why you're not yes. able to get that uh, yes. out there? A lot because of that is, and we say this all the time, is EMS is the common denominator. So we don't get the press that the fire department gets. Right. But again, if a cop, if a fire, if a fireman pulls a kid out of a fire, they don't yell for a firefighter; they yell for a paramedic. Right. A but cop that, gets shot; they don't yell for another cop; they yell for a paramedic. We don't get the advertisement, right. and we don't get the we don't get the attention that the other services get, and that has a lot to do with oh, it's an ambulance. They have no idea until you absolutely need one. And we have that generation. My parents are in the mid '70s. They still remember the funeral home guys coming out and throwing people on the stretcher. They were ambulance drivers, literally. So. But just you guys can spread the word. We did all that training with the CPR and stop the bleed. We trained 309 people. Awesome. Well, yeah, beyond belief, awesome. Um, a lot of people asking about additional training. We are actually holding a summertime EMT class, hybrid, accelerated. It's going to start June 10th, ends August 12th. It's going to be no nonsense class. It's going to be hard, but spread the word. I got three faculty already signed up for it. So it'll be a lot of fun, too. So if you're thinking about it, it's a great way to spend the summer. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you all very much. Yeah, I appreciate you taking the time to be here. Very much. Please tell some folks.